Make a survey of your body. Start with the toes. Come up the legs. And if you notice any tension in any of the muscles, see if you can relax it. Try to notice which muscles you use to tense up as you breathe in, and see if you can breathe in without tensing them up. Work your way up through the torso, the neck, the head, then with the arms. Start with the fingers, up the arms to the shoulders. And see if your mind is willing to settle down with the sensation of the body as it relaxes here into the present moment. But it is fine. If it's not willing to settle down, you have to ask yourself what the problem is. What kind of thoughts does it tend to go toward? What thoughts are running through the mind that have some Velcro on them that pull you away? And try to think in a way that pulls you away from those thoughts, strips off the Velcro. Think of the Buddha in the night of his awakening. If you think you have narratives coming in from the day, that first knowledge that he gained in the first watch of the night, narratives going back thousands of aeons, he didn't get stuck on any of them. He knows this, this, this. He was born here, looked like that, had this name, belonged to this clan, as he said, which could either be a clan in a, as a human being, or a species of animal, or a type of deva. Had this experience of pleasure and pain, ate this kind of food, and then died. He took birth again and again and again. And just think about how many, many lifetimes he'd been through it. It stretched his mind. It stretched it so, in linear terms, it was just too long to keep any particular detail from any particular life. That helped get him out of some of his narratives. And then in the second watch, he had a question. He had noticed that in that first knowledge he gained, he had been born as many different kinds of things. There was a theory back in those days, especially promoted by the Brahmins, that wherever you were in this lifetime, you'd be born as that thing in the next lifetime. Brahmins would be born as Brahmins. Slaves were born as slaves. In other words, you were stuck where you were. Of course, they liked that because that put them on the top of the heap. But he saw that that wasn't true. You can go up, you can go down. And sometimes it just seems so erratic. He said, compared it to a stick that you throw into the air. Sometimes it lands on this end, sometimes it lands on that end, sometimes it lands splat in the middle. And he wondered if there was any pattern. Why were there, there changes? So he turned his mind to thinking of all beings dying and being reborn, to see what the pattern was. And he figured out it had to do with their actions. Skillful actions led to good rebirths, unskillful ones led to bad rebirths. It was a tendency, because of course everybody's actions were basically a mix. And in particular, it had to do with what kind of views they held at death. That taught him a couple of things. One, the power of action. Two, the power of the present moment, your actions in the present moment. There are times when you could have done bad things in this lifetime, but of course not all the things you did were bad. But at the moment of death, you developed the right view. That would help save you for a little while at least. It wouldn't totally wipe out the effects of past bad karma, but it would give you a reprieve for a while. And who knows? Maybe like Angulimala, you could train your mind so it wouldn't have to suffer from those bad things. So seeing the power of the mind, seeing the power of the present moment, then he focused on his mind in the present moment in the third watch. So you see what he's doing? He's stretching his mind before he settles in. With the body, we stretch it, stretch it forward, stretch it back the left, right, 
But the mind, when you stretch it, first you stretch it in terms of time. Just think how long the time has been that you've been going through all these different narratives to the point where they become meaningless. And then you expand that you think of all the universe. You're not the only one with lots of narratives. You're not the only one who's made a lot of mistakes. You're not the only one who's done things really cleverly. And the whole point of this is that it makes all those narratives meaningless. So when the mind tends to go to a particular narrative, try to put it into this perspective, either the perspective of deep time or wide space or both. And it's easier for, to let go of it. So when the mind is small, that it can hold on to these things. When you stretch it, These things slip from its grasp, and then you can focus it, and you've got the right attitude to bring to it, because there will still be a commentary going on in the mind as you're trying to get the mind to settle down. These things are going well. Your mind yourself don't get excited, because you've botched it many times in the past. Something goes well, and you get all worked up about it, and it's gone. When things are not going well, don't get depressed. Don't get discouraged. You've been through some pretty bad things in the past, but you're able to get out. It's when the mind is small that the narratives of you being a great meditator, you being a bad meditator, have some meaning. And the meaning is not helpful. You want a larger meaning. You've been through these patterns many times before. So in order to wear your successes well and where your mistakes well. Remember the successes so you can try to recreate them the next time you meditate. When you've got something going well, try to get a sense of balance. How do I keep this going without giving in to the urge to get worked up about it? When things are not going well, Watch out for the narrative. This is here it is proof that you're a bad meditator. You'll never get anywhere. That's not going to help. You've been down before and you've been up before. Like that other image the Buddha gives based on deep time. When you see somebody who's really poor and miserable, you've been there. You see someone who's really rich, with lots of power, lots of wealth, lots of beauty, whatever. You've been there too. You're not a stranger to anything in the universe. Think that way. So you want to learn from the ups and learn from the downs, so the mind isn't pushed up and down by them, I'm trying to keep everything on an even keel. And it's a lot easier when the mind is large. This is one of the reasons why when the Buddha taught concentration practice, he never mentions where in the body you should focus, say, when you're focusing on the breath. He says, be aware of the whole body. When you spring thoughts of goodwill, thoughts of compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity, you make those large as well. In fact, the statement, the phrase, magatang jitang, the enlarged mind, Description of the mind in concentration. So even though sometimes when we think about concentration, we think of the mind being focused down to one sharp point. That's not what the Buddha is teaching. Fill your whole body with breath. Fill your whole body with your awareness. But don't fill it. Make your awareness so large that it leaves the body and goes someplace else. Just large enough to fill this fathom-long body. And then whatever comes in is not going to knock you off so easily. If your concentration is one-pointed, then as soon as the point moves, the concentration has been disturbed. But if you have this larger framework, things can come in, things can go. They don't disturb things so much. It's like having animals run through your mind. If you're on one spot, they can knock you over. 
In other words, the distractions knock you over really easily. But if you have a large, well-founded building, they can run in. They don't destroy anything because everything is solid inside. But you can bring this attitude to the concentration. You find it's easier to get into concentration and to stay here. And you're ready to do the work that needs to be done. Seeing through the disturbances. Once the mind has been nourished by the stillness, you put it to work to see what's the allure of the things that would pull you away. And the best way to know the allure is to refuse to go with them. And you'll see part of the mind will say, come on, come on. I want this, I want that. Well, why? And sometimes the mind will answer easily. Sometimes it'll be embarrassed, in which case you have to keep watching, watching. But it's going to reveal itself at some point, why you like these things that go against your concentration. Then you can pair the satisfaction you get out of the allure with all the drawbacks. This helps to pry you away from a lot of your attachments. You may still have your attachment to concentration, but for the time being, allow that. Because it's a useful attachment. You can do lots of good work with that. It's only when the outside work is done that you can turn it in, the analysis in on the concentration itself. To look for ups and downs and the disturbances there. And ask yourself, well, what am I doing that's causing that? Again, you have to watch. Like someone who's posted to watch criminals in a building across the, ro across the street. You have to sit there very carefully and very, very patiently. But ultimately, these things will reveal themselves. If your gaze is steady enough and you ask the right questions, things will be revealed. Now work on that steady gaze. And anything that threatens to really pull you away, maybe it's a sign you've got to stretch your mind again. Think back over deep time, think uh, over wide space. Makes it a lot easier to let go of the little, little things that would otherwise loom large. <laughs>